Jane Wiffen from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Increase the Size of Your Marketing Pizza Pie. And I don't know about you guys, but it's right before lunchtime and it's already making me hungry. But we have a very special guest today with us. His name is Andrew Davis. And Andrew is an expert marketer, speaker, and author of the book, Brandscaping. His 20-year career has taken him from local television to the Today Show. He's worked for the Muppets in New York, written for Charles Kuralt, and marketed for tiny startups as well as Fortune 500 brands. All in all, we're really excited to have such a smart, fun guy like Andrew Davis on board for today's webinar, so we're really excited for today. Before I get started and hand it over to Andrew, I just have a couple of things to note. Today's webinar will be available for viewing by tomorrow, and we will send out a link to the presentation and a video of the webinar so you can review. We'll also be happy to answer any of your questions, so if you take a peek at your webinar software, you'll see a little question section, and you can go ahead and send those over to me, and I will ask Andrew after his presentation is over. Alternatively, you can also tweet us. You can tweet me at the hashtag VMWebinar, and we'll also get them that way. If you have any technical problems, I always find the best way to fix that is just to sign off and then reconnect, and hopefully that fixes any issues. So I think that's all of my notes, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our presenter, Andrew Davis. Thank you, Quinn. I am very excited about doing this. This is so much fun. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, to be part of the Vertical Measures webinar series. Um, I know I'm in good company. So yeah, we're going to talk about increasing the size of your marketing pizza pie. And uh, it, you know, pizza is not included in this presentation. You have to find your own. I'm on the East Coast, so it's after lunch for many of us. Uh, but if you're on the West Coast, get some pizza and enjoy the next 45 minutes. Uh, we are going to talk about marketing pizza because we like pie charts as marketers. Uh, but let me tell you where this came about. I actually grew up in Houston, Texas, and I was a swimmer um, on the swim team in, in middle school. And for some reason in the 80s, uh, I don't know why, but they, the, the health kick uh, concept there was that you would actually carbo-load. You would eat as many carbohydrates as you could before you had a, an athletic event, and that would give you the energy and stamina to go through. So we would go to this pizza hut uh, in Houston and carbo-load before every swim meet. So this is 1985. I'm, I'm, at, I'm like in middle school, eighth grade or sixth grade or something, and I'm standing in line at the pizza hut, and there's, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm about to to order my pizza and there's a woman in front of me and she orders a pizza. Uh, she orders a large pizza and a Diet Coke and the guy behind the counter says, hey, would you like that, that, that pizza cut into eight slices or ten? And she says, eight. I could never eat ten. And as I think about this, I'm thinking, wait a second. This is the, the, the pizza pie is the same size. It's still the same size of pizza. It's just the slices are different. And this is the problem we face in marketing, okay? The marketing pie for us isn't getting any bigger. In fact, it's just getting sliced more and more ways. And if you start thinking as, you, as a marketer about your CMO pizza, you're slicing up your 100% of your marketing budget into a series of different activities. And maybe 10 years ago, those activities were just five or six things, maybe advertising and public relations and, and promotions and events. Let's Say. And, and as the technology has advanced and as we've had more and more tools available to us, we've still only got the same size pizza about, and we still are slicing the pizza more and more ways. So we're cutting out of advertising if we want to do more promotions, or when Interactive came around, first it was just you need a website, then you need SEO, then you need SEM, then you need pay-per-click, then you need the Facebook stuff, then you need social media. Now your social media pie is bigger than your interactive pie. Then you've got direct mail. This is what has happened, okay? We have to start thinking thinking about our CMO pizza. <clears throat> Where are we taking money from to go to do things like content marketing? Now, content marketing is great. It's absolutely unbelievably powerful, but it makes me wonder where are we stealing the budget from and why are we stealing it? So I started to ask myself, why do CMOs, why do marketers invest in these specific slices of the pie? And if you ask most marketers, and even if you look at the CMI, like Content Marketing Institute data for content marketing, a, a lot of people are actually engaged 
engaging in content marketing and, and, and primarily in any marketing activity to raise awareness. And awareness equals market share, okay? So market share for widgets, this, if this was your company, you sell widgets, and your total market size is $100, you're looking at your competitors who have these other slices of the pie, and you, let's say, you have a 10% of the market, 10% market share, and that's equal to $10, okay? Now, if you want to work on awareness and you want to just get more people aware of your brand, you're trying to increase market share every year, right? So if you, if this year you can turn it into 11% market share, that's great. You just went up to an $11 market. Uh, if it's, if it's t you know, $12 next year, uh, that's a 12% market share. So you're trying to steal market share from your competitors. Now this is interesting if you're focused on raising awareness, and this is completely an awareness play. And when I talk to marketers today, I say, look, if you want to raise awareness, the best, the most cost-effective way to do it is to buy ads. If you want to raise awareness, buy ads, okay? So that's your ad slice of the budget. If you want to raise awareness, buy ads. It's the easiest thing to do. Here's the thing. If you want to increase market size and you start thinking about making the pizza pie bigger, so you take that $100 market where you're, you're only having 10% market share and you turn it into a $200 market and you still only have 10% market share. You didn't have to increase your awareness. You now doubled the size of your market and your revenue. And if you do that again, let's say and you get to $300 market and you get three times the size of it is currently, now you have a $30 market share even though you're still at 10%. I want you to think about increasing the size of the market if you're going to invest in content marketing because if you want to increase demand, create content. So the pizza is a great way to think about your budget and it's a great way to think about your market. If you want to raise awareness, buy ads. If you want to increase demand, create content. I want you to start thinking about increasing demand. Now, we're going to talk about the consumer journey just quickly um, because this is, a, this is a really great point to, to showcase where increasing the demand works. And if you don't know what the consumer journey is, think of it as an alternative to the funnel. It's not got a beginning, a middle, and end. It's just got a start and then a series of interlocking loops. And I always start with the consumer journey at the moment of inspiration, okay? The moment of inspiration is the instant in time that sends you on a journey that you never expected. And that that could be for anything. Like, uh, uh, you, if you all of a sudden watch a, um, you know, Top Gear on on BBC America, and you decide you want an, a brand new car and you want it to be a Bentley, you have just been triggered to go buy a new car. Okay. The trigger is the journey you're going to be on. The moment of inspiration was watching Top Gear. And the initial consideration set is the first brand that comes to your mind when I say go buy a new car. You, Whatever it is, you say it to yourself right now. I don't know if it's Toyota or Honda or a Prius or maybe you said Mercedes or Audi or Ferrari. It does Whatever it is, that's the brand that came to your mind first. That's the initial consideration set. And that's where awareness plays in. So if you're trying to win the awareness game, you can win the initial consideration set. But what happens? in the online world and especially in the digital world today is you move into the active evaluation phase where you're adding and subtracting brands uh, from you know f from your uh, selection set as you move closer and closer to a moment of purchase and you know so if it was the car example maybe the first brand that came to your mind was Mercedes then you uh, you're driving down the street and you see an Audi and you add the Audi and then you see a VW and you add a VW and then you get back to your office and you look up how much the Mercedes costs and you're like wait that's way too much so you subtract the Mercedes from your list now you've only got two you're moving closer and closer to the moment of purchase even before you're starting to do research and these two numbers here are just important 57% of B2B buyers make a decision on which supplier they want to work with before they actually contact the supplier. So before they're even interacting with you, they've gone through this active evaluation phase. 72% of consumers in the B2C world have already made a decision on who they want to work with or buy from before they've uh, had a brand interaction. So this is all about getting those views. This is when people are creating content that you're viewing but not making a decision. And I want to point out, Arnie, you know, who's, uh, who's the guy behind the guy behind the guy at Vertical Measures, he, he does this great example of creating content for a trip to the Grand Canyon. And he shows all these wonderful things that you can do to create great content um, to help people, uh, you know, g interact with your brand and consume your content for, for an itinerary for two days at the Grand Canyon, or maybe an itinerary for river rafting on the Grand Canyon, or maybe an itinerary for three days on the Grand Canyon. And if you create those pieces of content, 
the, the people that are on that active evaluation journey will consume that content. As they get closer and closer to the moment of purchase, you're hoping they will build a relationship with your brand and buy from you. That's when you get to the moment of purchase, okay? We're going to come back to Arnie's example of the Grand Canyon journey in just a moment. But I want you to think about the moment of purchase as the moment that, you know, if you ran a river rafting tour operation on the Grand Canyon uh, on the Colorado River, the moment someone signs up for your tour, that's the moment of purchase. And then they're in the loyalty loop. And in the loyalty loop, you basically have to leverage your experience uh, that you create from the, the river rafting tour uh, or from buying a Nissan Murano to uh, get people to inspire others and send them to the moment of purchase faster. Or you can think of it as people who commit to consuming your content on a regular basis. They subscribe to something and they're sent on a journey or they share it with others that inspire people to go on a journey faster to you and they bypass active evaluation. Now, we're going to talk about today, when I'm, when I'm talking about increasing the size of your pizza pie, we're not talking about Arnie's strategy. Now, this kind of strategy is absolutely necessary. It's something that I do believe in intently. I just want to expand your thinking, okay? We are great at creating that kind of content that answers people's questions when they're already far down the path of active evaluation and trying to consider it. I want you to think about, instead of you know the three-day itinerary for things to do at the Grand Canyon, I want you to think about the moment of inspiration. What if you could get more people to go to the Grand Canyon? What if you actually inspired people to go to the Grand Canyon and you were the one that owned the journey from the beginning? So you even keep them out of that active evaluation because you inspired the journey. This is the biggest opportunity in marketing today and that increases the size of the pie. People who weren't going to come to the Grand Canyon are now coming. Here's an example of what this would look like. If you were looking for Boy Scout troop ad adventures, let's say you're a Boy Scout troop counselor and you're trying to figure out something to do with your Boy Scout troop. That, they're not even considering the Grand Canyon right now, but if you could create content that inspired Boy Scout troops to take a trip across the country and spend five days on a river raft in the Grand Canyon, you will win and own that audience. That is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about increasing the size of the pie. Hopefully this is helping. I can't see the questions, so if you have questions, make sure you're asking them. Because if you want to own the consumer journey, if you want to increase the size of the pie, you have to create those moments of inspiration. You have to think about triggering an irresistible urge to act that actually inspires a specific audience to grow the size of the pie. All right? I just need to take a sip of water. Hopefully, oh, sorry, hold on. I know you can't see me, but I'm drinking. Mm. That is good water. Uh, yes. Okay. So let's let's talk about let's talk about an example of this. Okay. This is an example of someone who made a bigger pie but didn't have to use any pizza. Okay. This is a company called Breville. And if you don't know Breville, they're they're a kitchen appliance manufacturer. They make countertop appliances like electric woks and waffle irons and and grills, panini presses, microwave ovens, ovens, bread makers, all sorts of stuff. And they wanted to increase demand for juicers. Okay. So they sell juicers in the marketplace. And now this is where I want you to go out and start doing some experimenting. I want you to go experiment with Google Trends. Google Trends. If you don't know what Google Trends is, go to google.com slash trends and, then let's, and, and watch this example. You'll get a good idea. Google Trends actually shows you the aggregate search for a search term over time relative to itself. So you're looking at people who have searched for juicing on a scale of 0 to 100. 100 being the most people that ever searched for juicing and 0 being no people searching for juicing. And if you can see here, there are spikes at the beginning of every year in the juicing cycle. Now think to yourself, why would that be? You got it. It's New Year's resolutions. You're going to lose some weight by juicing. And look at that. By March, you, you don't care anymore. And then there's a, there's a hump in the summer as well. Think about why that hump in the summer is. Let's go back to Google Trends and let's look at juicing and juicers. Now, we're looking at the size of the pizza pie, the size of the market now, okay? This is market for juicers in red. And you can see that hump in the summer and that hump right before New Year's. Those are people getting interested in juicers before they start their juicing for the new year. What's that hump in the summer? That's getting into your bathing suit. Okay, ladies, I know I know how it is. This is <laughs> this is what happens. Okay, so you're looking at demand for juicers in the marketplace. Now you're actually looking at market share and demand. So you're seeing the juicers in red. You're seeing Breville, the brand in in yellow, and you're seeing Jack Lalanne juicers, which if you don't know them, they're just another electric juicer manufacturer uh, in green. Okay, now that this is you can see the market share for Breville is pretty static, but it'll never get more than juicers. It's very hard to do that. So what you need to do is increase the size of the 
chocolate pie, get the, get more people interested in juicing and juicers as a result. So what did they do? Well, they partnered with a guy named uh, Joe Cross, who was creating a documentary film called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And I'll play a little bit for you. It doesn't work very well on webinars, but this it's a 90-minute documentary actually um, that was that was that aired. Uh, uh, that, that they produced uh, specifically targeting men, okay, and men over 40 who were interested in getting healthy. You can see here that Joe's not very healthy. And in the documentary, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of suspense, and you're wondering if Joe's going to die or if he's going to get healthy. And he actually meets a truck driver along the way, and and he becomes part of the plot. Joe, it, it, the movie is very good. I want you to go watch Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead and think about the impact it had on the size of the market. What they did was actually release the movie on Netflix that summer, summer of July uh, of, of 2010. And they distributed it online. And let's look now at Google Trends and let's look at the size of the pie. Where that blue arrow is, see it pointing at the yellow line? That yellow line is fat, sick, and nearly dead. And can you see how the size of the pie got bigger? Juicers went up. All of a sudden, interest in juicers spikes. Fat, sick, and nearly dead spikes. Breville spikes. And now you can see the impact in the market. That's increasing the size of the pie, not raising awareness for Breville juicers. And what happened to Breville juicers? They sold out around the world. Okay, they, It took them months to recover from the demand that was created for juicers. And it didn't just sell Breville juicers. It sold Jack LaLanne juicers and Oster juicers and all sorts of other brands in the marketplace because people got interested in juicing. I want you to think for a minute. Great content marketing is actually about increasing the size of the market, not increasing market share. Okay? I want you to think about that. Great content marketing is about increasing the size of the market, not increasing market share. That's what Breville did. What if you focused on increasing the size of the market, making the pizza pie bigger, and less on your awareness? What can you do to increase demand for the products and services you sell? Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead 2 actually just came out in January, and I went to Google Trends to see what happened, and you see that spike where it says A and B there at the end? That's Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead 2. Increasing demand for the, the, the size of the pie, increasing interest in juicing. Um, here's a little self-promotional piece, um, guys. But uh, I, if you're interested in Google Trends and this whole idea, we're doing a, a, a workshop uh, at Content Marketing World this year called Moneyball, Moneyball Marketing. Um, so you can check it out at bit.ly slash Moneyball Marketing if you're interested uh, in learning more about Google Trends. It's the most underutilized tool in the marketing world, and it's unbelievably powerful. I want you to start thinking like entertainment executives to make this pizza pie concept work for you, okay? You've got to start thinking about what increases demand in the marketplace and what kind of content could you create. I actually started in the television world, so I started working for NBC and I, I produced for uh, CNN and Fox and uh, I worked for the Today Show and I wrote for Charles Corral. I learned a lot about storytelling, but it wasn't until I got my job at the Jim Henson Company at the Muppets uh, where I actually learned um, about the power of this. And I was working on the on the show called Bear in the Big Blue House. And Bear in the Big Blue House, if you've seen it, is a great show, uh, by the way. But I, I, I was in charge of the budget for the show, and I quickly learned that we were $500,000 over budget for the season, and we hadn't even started production yet. And I was kind of panicked, because this is my new job. I've got to figure this out. And it wasn't until a few weeks later, after I started, that I met some people that worked in merchandising and licensing at the Jim Henson Company. And they didn't care much about the budget problems I had, because they knew that if the quality of the content was so good, if Bear was a beautiful puppet, and the show was great, and the scripting was good, and the music was wonderful, and the puppets were lovable, that you would be able to create merchandise as a result and sell that. Okay, So Bear in the Big Blue House interactive toy, they'd sell hundreds and thousands of units of only if the content was good. And I couldn't compromise the quality of the content. Think about Sesame Street. There's no reason to you know buy a Grover uh, plush doll unless you fall in love with Grover. right? So you've got to create content that inspires people to buy things they didn't know they needed even. This is what I learned at the Jim Henson Company. You can have a whole birthday party that's Sesame Street themed. In fact, if you go to Amazon right now, you'll find 24,000 thousand products that are Sesame Street themed. That's CDs and DVDs and books and plush dolls and pillowcases and sleeping bags and toys and it, it, the stickers. It doesn't matter what. It's all there and it only exists because the content was so good. Here's the thing. Nothing has fueled our consumer culture more than the content brands we love. Valuable content increases demand for the products and services you sell. It inspires people to buy something they didn't know they needed.
Let, let's look at some other examples, okay? Let's look at an example for Lucky Strike cigarettes, okay? Since 2007, there's been a 44% increase in sales. They've sold 10 billion cigarettes, and the only brand that's growing in the marketplace today when it comes to cigarettes is Lucky Strike. It's growing five times faster than the rest of the industry. How about Canadian Club? Since 2007, they kicked 17 years of decline, and they have 4.3% growth year over year for seven years. Why is this? Think to yourself. Yell it out if you know it. I couldn't hear you. Just kidding. It's Mad Men, okay? Every episode of Mad Men has them smoking Lucky Strike and drinking crappy whiskey. The content is so good that it inspires people to buy cigarettes, to kill themselves smoking, and drink crappy whiskey. It's not just Mad Men. Even 16 and Pregnant, which is an MTV show about uh, teenage pregnancy, has been attributed with in, uh, decreasing the amount of teen pregnancies in the United States by 5.5% in only one year. It has inspired people to actually uh, rethink uh, uh, you know, their, their habits. And, and not only that, every time 16 and Pregnant airs, what happens to condom sales? They go up. Okay, uh, it increases demand for products and services in the marketplace. What about Vampire Diaries? If you've watched any of the Vampire Diary shows or any of the Vampire shows or in the last uh, you know few years, you'll know that the number one selling product at Spencer Gifts is a $19 scarecrow fangs. Okay, these fangs are $20. That they did they no one needs $20 fangs unless you fall in love with the content that's being created. So I want you to think like a television executive. Um, all right, I need another sip of water before we go into our simple secrets. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. Quinn, jump, jump in if you have a question if you, or, or if you can't hear me. Yeah, Ooh. I think we're good so far. I'm drinking water. It's very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to talk about uh, the four simple secrets now. Um, so here we go. All right, the uh, secret number one is get rich, target a niche. Now, you'll notice even in that first piece where I was talking to you about the Grand Canyon and the Boy Scouts, I picked the Boy Scouts, okay, because I knew that was a fractal market. It's a niche that we could go after and actually inspire that whole audience to consider a trip to the Grand Canyon. It's a very core piece of actually being successful and increasing demand. Remember, in Frat Sick and Nearly Dead, it, we were going after men, 40-year-old men. Because men aren't targeted with lots of dietary pro programs and get 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 slim fast deals. This is what fractal marketing is. It's actually dividing and subdividing your audience until you find a valuable enough audience that's deep enough and still worth going after. Let me show you what this looks like. You might have seen my chicken um, whisperer example before. This is a new example, just so you can see that it works with almost anything. And I'll show you someone else that it's worked with in the B2B space as well. But Let's say you're going after engaged women, okay? Let's say you're this kind of wedding gown designer, and you're, you, there are 2.3 million weddings every year. That's plenty of weddings in the United States to go after. So you might say you're going after engaged weddings, uh, women and you sell wedding gowns. Now, what's interesting about this is if you start dividing and subdividing the audience, it starts to get more and more interesting. Let's divide it into planning a Western wedding, like a traditional Western wedding that most, many of us would think about, or an Eastern-style wedding. Okay, let's go down the Eastern style wedding uh, tree. It might be Russian Eastern or Asian Eastern. Okay, let's go down the Asian Eastern tree. It, you know, it might be Asian uh, like like a Chinese or Japanese, or it might be Indian uh, like uh, like a Sari uh, or Hindi. Okay, or maybe it's Indian and uh, Hindi and Romani. And if you go down the Romani Indian wedding planning tree uh, for engaged women, you will find Gypsy Romanis and Gypsy weddings. And some of you might already be aware of this show, but this is my big fat Gypsy wedding. Uh, and if you if you've seen it, it's on um, it's it's on TLC, okay? Uh, you can see from the video I'm showing you that it's a little crazy, um, and it's a little over the top, but this is a niche worth going after, okay? And this is the kind of gown that you wear if you're a Gypsy Romani uh, wedding gown uh, viewer, if you're, if you're looking for something like this. They're amazingly intricate. They're full of uh, jewels and, and uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, accoutrements that make it really over the top in my mind. Well, this is Sandra Celli, and she is the queen of bling. Her motto is bling it on. She's the one holding the bag, not the one getting married, by the way. And Sandra Celli um, is actually has, has a, a little store in Waltham, Massachusetts. And 10 years ago, she was struggling to make her wedding business work because she was going after everything. 
everyone. And all of a sudden, she started realizing that she was getting these orders in a small town in Virginia constantly for wedding gowns that were all blinged out. So she sent a friend to go check out this little town and see what was there. And when her friend went, she called Sandra on the phone and said, Sandra, you will not believe this, but it's a whole, a whole little a subculture here of Romani gypsies, and they love your wedding gowns. They had actually found her name and number from a department store Rolodex and started calling Sandra Celli from Virginia to make these gowns. So next thing you know, Sandra starts a, a Facebook page. She starts getting everybody to understand that she makes these gypsy wedding gowns, and that's when a, 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 you know people start sharing these on Twitter, uh, and all of a sudden, more and more people are not just buying blinged out wedding gowns, they understand her as the queen of bling. And then a producer and director of My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding on TLC, Jenny Popplewell, was looking for these people, these designers, and they reached out to Sandra to find out if she was interested in being on the show. And next thing you know, she's on the show with one booming business and 24 million viewers every season watching My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. And so now she's not just a wedding gown manufacturer uh, and, and she doesn't have just a wedding gown business. She actually creates all sorts of blinged out stuff. She does it for uh, you know ice skaters, for wrestlers. She does all the Patriots cheerleaders for the New England Patriots, they, their outfits every year. She even does synchronized swimmers, and she even has a line of blinged out dog supplies, okay? This Sandra Celli's business was built by going really deep. You don't actually need a TV show her, like hers. You just need the courage to commit to a niche. What if you dive deep into your existing customer or client list and find the audience no one else targets? Where can you become the exclusive provider at higher margins, even if it's really deep at the gypsy wedding, gypsies, uh, Romani, uh, Indian wedding, Asian wedding gown style engagement woman. <laughs> um, but you see what I mean. When you go deep like this, when you explore your niches and you commit to a niche, you can find those Romani gypsies and you can actually create content that inspires them to buy something they didn't know they needed. And it works for anyone. This is actually a financial advisor named Chris Giroux I met in Canada. Uh, and when I met him, I was shocked. He is a financial advisor who realized that he could actually just go after emergency services personnel because they have very specific needs. So he created Frontline Wealth, and instead of just being a financial advisor for everyone, he's a financial advisor for prote that protects those who protect us. And that niche has been very beneficial for him. It's also the reason he's able to increase the size of his pie. He's able to get more and more people in that niche to buy from him. People that weren't considering buying uh, you know, his financial products in the first place are now considering it. So, let, all right, let's go on to secret number two. You have to embrace a beginner's mind. You have to go back to the very beginning, and, and you know, just like when, I, when we're talking about the difference between Arnie's approach and, and my approach that I'm putting forth here, if, you're, if, you're, if you already know that people are coming to, to the Grand Canyon, you'll put together a different kind of, of material and content uh, uh, that's, that's totally different than if you're trying to convince people to just come to the Grand Canyon when they've got the rest of the world as an option. And you've got to embrace the beginner's mind. Act like you know nothing about what you sell if you want to be successful. This is Jenny Doan, and she actually lives in Hamilton, Missouri. And in 2008, she was kind of in a predicament. Her husband was about to lose his job at the local newspaper. Uh, they had a, a quilt shop there that wasn't very busy, and they didn't know what to do with it, and they thought maybe they'll have to leave Hamilton, Missouri. So Jenny Doan sat down with her son and had a conversation about the quilting business, and her son, Al, said, hey, how long does it take to make a quilt? And Jenny said, well, it takes about nine months. Uh, and he was like, well, that's not going to work. We can't make very many quilts uh, if it takes nine months. And she said, well, I have this idea for what I call quick quilting, that you can do a quilt in a day. And he's like, okay, this sounds good. So they sit down and they have this long conversation about what they could do and how they could build the business. This is Jenny and Al over, over lunch. And they decide, Al decides, what we want to do is get more people interested in quick quilting. So they, they actually started creating videos on a YouTube channel. This is Sarah, uh, who started doing these YouTube videos for Missouri Star Quilting Company to get people introduced to the idea of quick quilting. And, and you know, they, were, they started getting them going. But you've, remember, you've got to get the beginner's mind. You've got to convince people that they should start doing quick quilting tutorials. And what they did was actually embrace Jenny as the talent. And this is Jenny on one of the very early videos. 
doing a quick quilting tutorial from the very beginning. And Al would keep, help her, you know, get 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 the beginner's mind because Al doesn't know anything about quilting. So he would stop her and say, "I don't know what that kind of you know quilt stitch is. We've got to start over." And she got pretty frustrated over it. But they've been doing a video every single week for years, and now they have 240,000 subscribers who are interested in quick quilting. About 63% of those subscribers watch every single video she creates, and Jenny is magnetic. She's such a great personality. You should go look at one of these videos when you have a chance. She's so fun. She's so excited, and now she's embraced the beginner's mindset and got so many people interested in quick quilting that people want to see more Jenny. Look at this. It says, check out the Quilter's Daily Deal. Did you miss any of these great tutorials? Click for more Jenny. It doesn't say quick click for more quilting. They People love Jenny Doan, and they love her so much that they actually quilt next to their iPad. <laughs> they watch her tutorials and quilt at the same time. And she has hundreds of these beginner style videos that get people inspired to do quilting. This is increasing the size of the market. There are plenty of people that are interested in quilting. Can I get them interested in quick quilting? And can I start from scratch? She's done an amazing job even advertising. Uh, I'll just show you quickly. You, you don't need to hear it even. But this is her, uh, her, her advertisement on her YouTube channel. You should all go look at it because it's got a lot of personality and it's also about helping people embrace the quick quilting concept and also in get them to come to Hamilton, Missouri. They have the largest supply of pre-cut fabrics in the world in Hamilton, Missouri, which is in the middle of nowhere. And it's not just young people that are going to Hamilton, Missouri now to meet Jenny Doan because they've got into quick quilting. It's, old, it's not old people, it's young people. This is a, a young woman who drove from New York to go to Hamilton, Missouri and see the store. Now they could order online, right? Missouri Star Quilt Company has a great website and they process lots of orders, but they've turned around the town with this amazing experience, all driven by Jenny Doan's ability to increase the size of the marketing pie. They, beautiful stores. And today, Jenny Doan is the largest employer in the county. She has 124 full-time employees. She's got 17 buildings downtown. They even have some restaurants because these women drag their bored husbands to this town and they don't have anything to do. They get 50,000 visitors a year. That's increasing the size of the pie. They, let's say they do 3,000 online orders every day. They do about a $50 average order, let's say. That's a $30 million a year business just by increasing the size of the pie. And it's all because they attach Dal, uh, you know, um, the, uh, Jenny to the talent, uh, as the talent to the content brand, embraced the beginner's mind, and actually you know, created demand for this. If you want to actually hear Jenny Doan's story, it's one of my favorite podcast episodes. You can check it out at bit.ly slash claim your fame. Uh, but it's a really great story, and you'll hear from Jenny herself how she did this. Um, all right, I think we have time. We're doing okay on time. Okay, good. Uh, let me get you secret number three. One more sip of water. Sorry, I don't know why it's so dry here. Hmm. I hope you guys are enjoying this. It's hard when I can't see you. Okay, secret number three. Um, you, you actually can think of this as creating the problem in the mind of your audience. Uh, and there's a great example of this by a guy named Dr. Bob Wagstaff, okay? Now, Dr. Bob Wagstaff invented the Aura brush, which you can see up here on the right. And it's actually a tongue brush, okay? It's, it's not a toothbrush. It's a tongue brush. And for 10 years, he was trying to sell this thing, and no one was buying it. In fact, he had spent $50,000 on an infomercial, and his return on investment was 100 Aura brushes sold, okay? Nothing for $50,000. So his real goal was to get Aura brush into retail, and he went to um, BYU, Brigham Young University, and asked a set of master's students, MBA students, to work on this project. And, and he was at wit's end. He said to the students, look, if, if I can't make this business work, I'm going to give up and, and I'm going to throw away the, the 100,000 aura brushes I have in my, in my warehouse and I'm just going to not sell this anymore, but can you help me see if there's a market for this? And the, the whole class worked on this project for a semester and the consensus was that 93% of America does not want an aura brush and it's probably not a good idea to do this. There was only one student, a guy named Jeffrey, who after class came up to Dr. Bob and said, look, Dr. Bob, I think they're right. 93% of America does not want a tongue brush but 7% of America does. And 7% of 300 million is a lot of people, and I think we can sell your Aura brush to those people if we can figure out who they were. And Dr. Bob said, let's do it. And Jeffrey went on board with Dr. Bob to figure out how to do this. And he very quickly realized that there was a problem. People don't know if they have bad breath. Uh, so they, they, they basically, for $500, created a video on how to tell if you have bad breath. This is creating the problem, right? It's increasing demand for the product you sell, which is, in this case, 
a tongue brush. And no one needs a tongue brush unless they know if they have bad breath. You should all go watch this video or I'll just give you the shortcut. But you just get a, a metal spoon, you scrape your tongue uh, on the spoon, then you let the spoon dry and you smell it. And if the smell, if the, if the you know, spoon smells, then you have bad breath. That's how you do it. So for $500, all of a sudden, uh, and he actually bought some, um, some ads on YouTube to get people to watch this, all of a sudden, he was increasing demand. He started selling Aura brushes. Uh, not only did he sell just a little bit of Aura brushes, he started selling a lot. You can see the ad here, smell your own breath. And he was going after teenage boys, right? Impressionable teenage boys who want to have their first kiss and they don't want their breath to stink. So for $40 in paid media, a total of investment of four, $540, they sold 10,000 units in five weeks. That is better than their $50,000 infomercial. And they did it by creating the problem in the mind of the audience. They actually created demand for the product. Now, they wanted to get into retail. Remember I told you they wanted to get into like Walmart and CVS. So what, what Jeffrey did was genius. He actually created a video just for Walmart. And he, he bought $28 worth of geo-targeted um, advertisements on Facebook for people who worked in it at Walmart. And the advertisement said, Walmart employees have bad breath. Walmart needs to carry Aura Brush. It will sell better than anything in your store, AuraBrush.com. And they very quickly got a call from uh, Walmart saying, please take down the ad. Uh, and, and a few weeks later, they got an email order for 735,000 units and the, the return on investment of a $528 ad plus video. That is thinking about the problem first. Create the demand for the product. So they've also created tons of great online content. They've got people to subscribe to weekly content uh, brought to you by a giant tongue. Remember, they're going after teenage boys. This is perfect content for a teenage boy. Uh, and, and this is how they've built their business. There's no pain. Uh, with, if there's no pain, there's no gain. So what if your moment of inspiration re redefines the problem in the, in the mind of your audience? Can you force the audience to rethink their existing solutions at that moment of inspiration and create the problem for them? All right, I've got one last secret, and then we'll sum up, and, and hopefully we have some questions from the audience. Secret number four is, all, is, is very simple. You've got to harness emotion with this, okay? Uh, and, and Dr. Donald Kahn, oh, sorry. Dr. Donald Kahn actually has a great quote about emotion. The essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action while reason leads to conclusions. Okay? Emotion leads to action while reason leads to conclusion. Too often the content marketing we're creating doesn't harness any emotion. And I want you to think about harnessing emotion even for the hardest products and services in the marketplace today. Remember I told you to think like a television executive? Well, this is, this is a show on Danish television. It's Avangerna. Uh, I always say it wrong, but that's close enough. And that means the legacy, okay? And, and the television show airs every Sunday night at 8 p.m. on Danish television, uh, and, and it's become a very big and successful show. 13 weeks of the show aired. Um, and it's a very emotional show about a, a famous artist who you see here on the left uh, and who dies. He dies and doesn't leave a will. So now, all of a sudden, the family is left in turmoil trying to figure out who gets the, the leftover artwork, who gets his estate, uh, and then there's, a, there's an adopted sister that, uh, that no one knew about that comes into the picture that, that, that uh, all of a sudden starts shaking things up. It's a very emotional show about what happens when somebody dies without a will. So what do you think happens on Monday morning? On Monday morning, all of a sudden, people call lawyers. They call lawyers because they want to get a will drawn up. So this is one lawyer who used to get seven new cases in a week. Now she gets seven new cases every Monday. People are moved by the show. The emotion of the show inspires them to call. And it's not just one lawyer. In fact, inquiries on their, their legal matching site have doubled. And traffic doubles every week, week over week, for anything having to do with estate lawyer articles because they're inspired by the emotion of the show. So I want you to think about uncovering those raw emotions attached to whatever you do, even if it's a B2B product, there are emotions there that people think about. What emotion inspires the action as it relates to the product and service you provide? You've got to harness the emotions of your audience. So I want you to think about these kinds of things, all right? Um, I should point out you've been drewed, and, and because we're talking about pizza, uh, signing up for, for inspiration over lunch is a good idea. This is a good time to do it. Uh, I'll send you six videos, inspirational videos, over the course of the next six weeks, so one every week for six weeks, uh, to keep you thinking big and strategically about increasing the size of your pizza pie. But look, you've got to harness emotion 
if you want to create those moments of inspiration that are designed to increase the size of the pie. We have to create the problem. Think about how Dr. Bob actually identified that if people don't know they have bad breath, they're never going to need a tongue breath brush, and he created one video that increased the demand for his product, 10,000 units sold. And, and what's interesting about Dr. Bob actually is now there's a bunch of copycat products from the biggest brands in the world because he created the market for it. We've got to embrace that beginner's Mind. Think about how Jenny Doan actually created an entirely new market by rethinking the way you quit quilt and then sharing and teaching those videos every week for two years online. She saved the town and actually has built a $30 million a year business. I want you to get rich by targeting your niche. Think about how Sandra Celli went deep enough to find an audience so valuable that she could sell a high margin product and think about what it's led to. It's led to a whole new series of businesses because she's known as the queen of bling. Think like a television executive. Think about Breville's 90-minute documentary that increased demand for juicers and juicing in the marketplace. They increased the size of the market. They didn't increase market share. They got more people interested in juicing. I want you to rethink that consumer journey. You've got to do what Arnie says you need to do, which is create that content for people that are on that search in active evaluation. But I don't want you to let yourself forget about the biggest opportunity in marketing today, which is focusing on that moment of inspiration. No one else is doing it. And if you can increase demand and you can own that person from the very beginning of their search and convince them that they should come to the Grand Canyon instead of just trying to get some of the people that come to the Grand Canyon to go on your rafting journey, you will own that audience. That's why that fractal of Boy Scouts could be really valuable. So let's stop thinking about awareness. Remember I said, if you want to raise awareness, buy ads. If you want to increase demand, sell, uh, create content. Okay? If you want to raise awareness, buy ads. If you want to increase demand, create content. That is how you increase the size of your marketing pizza pie. What if you increase the size of the pie? Okay. I think I lost track of my time. Hopefully we're doing okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, are we? Uh, these examples. I went, I went really stellar. fast. Oh, no, it's oh, good. good. Yeah, no, these examples, I've just, I've never heard of these companies, and I just think they illustrate your points so great. And especially since you brought up the Grand Canyon, you know, example that I've taught, you know, Arnie's <laughs> taught, but it totally makes sense, and I love to kind of flip it on its head and see it from your perspective as well. Um, oh, I'm so yeah, glad. So, <laughs> we do have quest time for questions, so if anyone has extra ones to send over, please do that either through Twitter with the hashtag VMWebinar or through the software. So I've got a question to start, and I know we've talked about this even before the webinar, and we've talked a lot about the pizza pie and how marketers are getting you know, their role sliced up into so many different pieces. We've got social media, yeah. email, uh, content, native advertising now. So how can we keep up, and what is the most important thing that you would recommend we should actually focus on amidst all these kind of competing priorities? Oh my lord! Well, you know, it's hard to it's hard to say you should just do like that. The, there's a most important one for everyone. Right. Um, you know, so I, I think the real question you have to ask yourself is especially if you're going to start something new. So if you're new to content marketing or you're new to social media or you're new to SEO, whatever it is, I think you want to ask yourself, what are you going to stop doing to start doing this? Because yeah. you're right, as marketers, we've ended up with this giant list of things that's only additive, and I'm not sure that the return on investment is equal to the amount of uh, you know, input we're, we're giving these things at this point. Um, and you can probably have a smaller, uh, you know, a, a pie that's sliced fewer ways and still have the same amount of impact, uh, if not more, and have a really clear understanding of what's driving the most value. So, uh, you know, but, but honestly, if I had to pick one thing that I think would make the biggest impact, um, it, it would be focusing on content marketing, um, and, and make and ensuring that you're going deep enough with your fractal. That's the biggest mistake I see people making. So it's really all about simplification, then it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. I mean, don't you feel like we've overcomplicated things? <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I mean. I, yeah, I think it's it's really about simplify. If your pizza pie is cut, you know, more than seven or eight ways, I think it's hard to know what's working um, and if it's working. 
Um, yeah. you know, and, and, and you know, to be totally honest, I have worked with and met brands who uh, you know spend 60 or 70 percent of their budget on advertising. I mean, brands like Geico spend a billion dollars a year on advertising, and it works. So. Yeah. You know, I can't. I can't really argue with that. If it works for them, right. great. Their, their pizza pie is 98% advertising, and uh, I don't know, 2% sponsorships. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they're doing something right, so it's okay. Oh yeah, it's 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 working for sure. So I, I wouldn't argue with it. But you know, you can see how simple their pie is, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. Cool. Well, we do have a question about, you had mentioned briefly your money ball marketing, and I actually yes. had wanted to ask that too, because we have a whole section of our content marketing workshops that we do about money ball, because it's just such a great movie and concept for content <laughs> marketing. But we oh, I didn't know that. that. Yeah, yeah, I should send over you some slides, but we have, um, we talk more about ideation, so how do you come up with so many topics that you can keep stepping up to the plate and getting on base? So if your oh, concept different, uh, or how, how does that work? Yes, yeah, my concept is different. Um, I mean, it, it's similar in the sense that uh, it's about rethinking what you're doing. Um, Moneyball marketing for me, especially Moneyball the movie, was actually really about redefining how you measure the value of a player. Um, oh. So... So I, I think we need to redefine how we measure the value of our content. And, and I actually think that Google Trends is one of the, the best ways and simplest ways to do that. So um, you, know, you can measure market share, you can measure market size, you can actually even see what moves your market. Um, it's, it's a really amazing, um, amazing tool. And, and I, I do think it's underutilized. Um, yeah. Here, you wanna, wanna see it at work? Can you still yeah, see my screen, see by the way? Yeah, we can. So. All right, let's see it. So, so you know, we just went through. Um, oh, my quick key is not working. Sorry. Uh, we just saw uh, it, it work for Breville. Um, this is Google Trends, and, and usually on the homepage, there's all sorts of random stuff. Um, but let's um, what's a good here, let's try vertical measures just for fun. Oh, oh my goodness. Sure okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that be fun. Hopefully, maybe Arnie's watching. This is nerve wracking. Here we go. Um, yeah, he probably so you might said, be. <laughs> when was Vertical Measures founded? Um, Do you know? I think it was. It's a, now it's oh a pop my goodness, quiz. I should know this. Maybe oh nine, oh ten, or ten. Oh nine. Maybe oh nine. Yeah, it looks like it looks like te it looks like December of oh nine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what you're actually looking at here is is the volume of people that have searched for vertical measures over time. And we can even add, like, um, here, you can even add Arnie. Yeah, wait, K-U-E-N-N, -N, right? Um, okay, so, so Arnie's brand is worth very little. Um, <laughs> or people misspell it. I don't know how people misspell it. Um, yeah, interesting. So you can add layers happens. and... Nothing. So you can add layers. You can even see geography. So like, let's go down to the United States. Um, you can see that uh, the search volume in Arizona. So this is you guys searching for yourself most of the time. Yeah. Um, or it could be clients if you have a lot of um, Arizona-based clients uh, mm -hmm. or even customers and referrals. But it looks like you're really big in Florida, Texas, and California. So if I was going to open up a second office, I would look at, at Florida as, as a potential market because people are, are already interested in the brand. Um, yeah. So you you know you and you can actually put a spike to these like I don't know what you guys were doing in February of 2014, but it looks like you made a big splash there that people were really interested in, um, and all of these spikes usually correlate to something. Um, so here I was just I can show you what I was just looking at. Um, I was looking at uh, no I spelled it wrong, dengue fever I don't know how to spell it. Oh yeah. Dengue like that I think. There we go. There go. So I was just I was just looking at the it, it doesn't just track you know the brand it tracks the market in general. So mm -hmm. um, I, you can actually correlate all of these spikes. Um, oh, let's take it off of the United States. Actually, uh, I don't. I want to go to the world. Yeah, um, you can click on worldwide there. Yeah. There so it'll actually. It actually shows you these, all of these spikes actually correlate directly to um, cases of dengue fever in specific countries. Yeah. Um, so it's a really powerful tool and it's really, really amazing to use.
I'm trying to think of a better example, like a product-based example. But anyway, that's what Moneyball yeah. marketing is all about for me. Awesome. Neat. Well, I like that we're both using it in just pretty different ways. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's fun. Yeah, and we've got one more question I think we've got time for. Oh, good. Um, they ask, what tools do you suggest for free to get awareness to a business? So this is going back to your raising awareness part. Oh, man. Uh, for raising awareness. Well, uh, if you want to raise awareness without buying it, I mean, it can be slow. It, like one of the one of the easiest ways is to form some partnerships, um, and those can be free. Uh, you know, so find businesses that. Uh, that's what my book actually, Brandscaping, is all about. But it's actually trying to find a business where y you want to ask yourself this question: What? Who has my next customer as their current customer? So think think up the food chain, right? Like if if you sold. Um, Baseball bats. Then, then who? What? What do people buy before they buy a baseball bat? Uh, that's who you want their, your partner to be. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what that is offhand, but maybe it's soccer balls. I don't know. Um, so anyway, but you want to you want to start partnering with other people and providing them with content or um, or even access to your audience. So that you're you're actually leveraging um, your your ability to provide them something you know something of value um, to in exchange for access to their audience. But to be honest, uh, I mean and the other way to do it is public relations. You know, can you and you can do that without hiring a PR firm. But can you get some press coverage um, on a consistent basis? That's going to help you raise awareness. You just have to be aware that it can end up with just a giant spike in interest and no long-term lasting effects, which is the same with raising awareness for anything. Like Great. a good example, a good example of that actually here is WestJet. Do you guys remember the WestJet? Oh, um, yeah. Like uh, what do they call it? Their their holiday thing where they that was the company that created that um, holiday video, Christmas video. Do you remember this? Um, that spike. I don't know. It was there. It was basically. Um, it's an airline that two in 2013, December of 2013. Uh, they they were doing a flight from. It's a Canadian airline. They were doing a flight mm -hmm. from. Uh, I think Montreal to Vancouver, so all the way across Canada, and they set up a kiosk. And you should go look at it on on YouTube. It's really fun to watch. They set mm -hmm. up a kiosk with Santa Claus in it um, at at the airport in Montreal, and they asked everybody to scan their ticket and then tell them what they wanted for Christmas. And meanwhile, they 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 while the people were flying across the country, uh, people in Vancouver went out and bought all the things that these people had wished for <laughs> when they asked Santa. So when they went to baggage claim, what came down the baggage chute? All the things they had asked for. Um, so that's a wow. good example of raising awareness without buying ads. You know, they mm -hmm. they created a great uh, you know viral campaign, and you can see this giant spike here where my key is. Um, mm -hmm. That huge spike actually increased ticket sales for two weeks um, following the release of this thing by 80%. But then you can see it drop wow. back down. You know, right? Um, and you want to think more like um, like a brand that's that's doing the opposite, like has really good consistent coverage, um, mm -hmm. like a Chipotle. You can see the difference, right? Yeah. So when they do get a spike, they're constantly moving up and to the right, and they're not just focused on viral hits and successes. Mm -hmm. That's the WestJet example down here. They're yeah. actually adding value um, as they move forward. Yeah, I just wrote an article about when they released the guacamole recipe. I know. I read your guacamole post. It was very good. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe you, one can, of those you can probably – yeah, when did they release it? Um, it was just about a month ago. So let's look. So, you can yeah. see it. You can actually probably see the demand, the increase in demand in guacamole as a result. So yeah. if it was a month ago, May, yeah, it must yeah. have been for May 5th, right? Um, let's About. just look at the last 90 days. So oh, wow. I bet I bet they released it here. C maybe? What is C? That's a news headline. Oh, that's the GMO release. GMO. I think it's so this. It is May. Huh? I bet it's May 5th. That's about right about it, I think, actually. And there you go. The guacamole went up as well. Yes. So they increased demand for guacamole, and it had a, a nice impact on their brand. Interesting. Cool. I like there seeing this. Thanks for making this a little more interactive. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. This is one of my favorite things to do.
Yeah, huh. it looks like you can spend a lot of time there. I can totally waste a lot of time here. Yes, yeah. for sure. Well, I think we're kind of getting down to the the end here. Oh, man. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much. This is really interesting, and I've gotten some good feedback already. So we really appreciate you coming on board for today. Oh, anytime. This has been really, really fun. So thanks so much for having me. And, yeah, uh, yeah I look forward to seeing you at some events. Yeah, for sure. And thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I've had a couple few questions about if we will be sending out the recording, which we will. Um, I will send that out by uh, sometime tomorrow morning, so you'll have that in your inbox when you get to work. Um, and we'll send um, the slides as well, so you can review it or send it along. And of course, we do this every month, so if you're interested in coming back, we'll have our next webinar on July 16th with Marcus Sheridan. He's the infamous sales lion who came he's from awesome. River Pools and Spa. Yes, he's great. River Pools and Spa, and he totally would be maybe one of these examples um, that Andrew has. So he'll be talking about the five most important subjects of any content marketing campaign to explode traffic, trust, leads, and sales. Um, so that's going to be a good one. I will send out a link tomorrow to start registering for that. But again, I'm Quinn from Vertical Measures. And again, thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everyone. Bye. Yeah. Have a good Thursday. See ya.